Welcome to Facing the Canon. My guest on the program is my friend, Dr. O.S. Hawkins, a church leader, influencer, and the author of the book, The Jesus Code. Dr. O.S. Hawkins, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, Jay John. It's a joy to see you and be with you again. Likewise. We've known each other for a little while and I'm delighted to have you on the program. Now, you grew up in Texas. How did you first encounter Jesus? Well, you know, I grew up in a really moral home. I never heard a prayer in my home. I never saw the Bible open in my home. And when I was 17, I could count on that hand, one hand, how many times I'd ever been to church. And it was midnight mass on Christmas Eve with my cousins because all my family except us were Catholic. After a basketball game one night, a young man, 17, my age, shared with me how Christ had come into his life. I couldn't get away from what he said. He took me to his church the next Sunday where I heard the gospel preached for the first time in my life, embraced it. I was totally transformed, J. John. Amazing. Old things literally became uh, passed away and all became new. And, you know, it was probably weeks, maybe months after that, before I ever heard the word repentance. But I know I repented that morning because immediately I started hating what I used to love and loving what I used to hate. I mean, places I used to like to go on Friday night had zero desire to do that anymore. Things I never thought I'd want to do by sitting, talking to some staid Englishman about the Bible like you. I found my greatest joy. Absolutely, OS. But isn't that any, a, a good reminder for us, OS, how one friend of yours invited you as a teenager right. to go to church and that one service had that impact right. upon you. Yeah, it was, a, it was certainly a divine appointment. And you know, when, when, when the Lord is working, you, you know this as well as anyone, but if God, in, in God impulses me to go to someone, I always believe it's because the Spirit of God is working on him also. If, if God calls Peter to leave Joppa and go to Caesarea, it'll be because there's a, there's a centurion there with whom he's under conviction. If he leads Philip to go to an Ethiopian desert, there's a eunuch that is searching for truth. So God is always working on both ends. He is, absolutely. Now, um, obviously, look, a teacher is in ministry, a postman is in ministry, someone that works in a supermarket is in ministry, but the Lord called you uh, to church ministry. How did that come about? I was, uh, all my life, I aspired to be a lawyer. My dad worked in the sewer department of the city of Fort Worth, and my mom made pies in a school cafeteria. But I'd always aspired to be a lawyer for some reason. I don't know why, but I would, when I was 10 or 12 years old, if I had a day off from school, I'd ride the bus downtown Fort Worth and sit in a courtroom all day. So I went to TCU, went through the business school, worked my way through there. And the summer before my senior year, when I was a taking the LSATs to apply for law school, uh, a hurricane had come through South Texas and Mexico and uh, destroyed a bunch of the poor levee area of Matamoros. And I got on a bus, me and a friend of mine who was there the day I was saved, that is still my best friend today, Jack Graham, who's pastor of a church here in Dallas. Yes. Jack and I got on, got on a bus and drove down to Brownsville and went across the border and lived with those people and shared Christ with them. I'd been a Christian about three years and coming back to, 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 to Fort Worth on that bus all night, I, I just uh, sensed God's call upon my life and surrendered it to it and have never looked back. God's allowed me to pastor some of the great churches in America and lead some of the great organizations. And I'm especially blessed. I know, absolutely wonderful. You, As you said, you pastored a number of churches. Uh, you ended up at First Baptist Church in Dallas, uh, where um, I had the privilege of preaching there because of you. And then following that, you went into quite a unique ministry. 
so tell us what you've been doing uh, for the last two or more decades. Well, for, for 25 years, I was president and CEO of an organization called Guidestone, uh, which serves 250,000 pastors and missionaries and Christian teachers and things with their financial needs and manages endowments for a lot of a lot of big institutions. We had $22 billion asset base. And we had a wonderful ministry there that we built called Mission Dignity, where at Guidestone, we're on a mission to bring dignity to some forgotten folks. And that's pastors and their widows in their declining years, retired. They pastored out in the crossroads of the countries where they never made enough to live on, much less retire on, were basically forgotten and are in such financial need. And so uh, many years ago, we could give them $50 a month. That helped. And now we've been able to raise so much money and all the royalties to all my books go to them. And thank God, it, millions of them have sold. And so uh, now the neediest get $750 a month. One little pastor's widow, 87 years of age, uh, wrote me recently and said, uh, I get to eat at night now, and it's not just a piece of toast. Oh, my So it's a wonderful word. thing. It it's is, a wonderful thing to be it extended. Is, you know, James oh. James said, pure and undefiled religion is what? To take care of widows and, widows orphans. and orphans. And that's been our... Yeah, so I did that 20 years. Then I'm now I'm the chancellor of uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, my, my own alma mater. Oh, how lovely and basically imparting the wisdom you've gained over the years uh, into a new generation of leaders. Trying to do so, teaching, teaching some preaching classes and other things there. It's really been energizing. And one of the things, I mean, your books have so inspired me, OS, seriously, uh, I, I've so enjoyed them. I, I want to mention this book, The Gospel Invitation. Now, I was really surprised because I've not come across a book like this in recent years. And this resonates with me so much. Uh, what prompted uh, you to write this? Well, the, you know, in the West, there, there are a growing number of churches that have ceased giving people opportunity to respond to the gospel at the end of the message. And it's, it's increasingly becoming in vogue here in America. And there's not been a major publisher publish a book on the gospel invitation uh, in uh, over 30 years. Yes. So uh, I, I, I wrote that book along with uh, my fellow cohort at the seminary, Dr. Matt Queen, to challenge people about the biblical basis, the historical basis, uh, and, uh, and it's very practical how to extend it. And so, you know, Peter stood and preached at Pentecost, preached a powerful message there in Acts chapter two, and he didn't finish that sermon and, and, uh, and, and with a pious prayer and say, amen, and sit down and cross his legs. The Bible says at the end of that sermon, with many other words, parakaleo, he called them alongside of himself. He exhorted them. He encouraged them to come to Christ with many other words. And as we know, 3,000 of them did and publicly identified with Christ in baptism and the church was born. So my, our encouragement is uh, for preachers to preach their message, their, their, their text-driven messages uh, and at the end, uh, with many other words, exhort people to come to Christ. Well, OS, uh, as you know, you know, I've been doing that um, for 45 years and I keep compelling people to receive Christ publicly. And when I came across this, it, it was just a real encouragement to me because sometimes in the church where we we want to kind of almost dilute so much of what we do today. Uh, yeah, we, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. That's exactly, uh, Jay John, why I wrote this code series. Yes. Uh, of the by uh, and for example, there there are fifteen of them in the series. They're all devotional books, 
the first one I wrote was for that very purpose. It's called the Joshua Code. Yes. 52 scripture verses every believer should know. You know, believers, they want to read the Word of God, and they start in Genesis, and by, if they get to Leviticus, they get bogged down. If they start in Matthew, immediately in the New Testament, they're introduced to dozens of names they have no idea of how to pronounce. And so what I did was I took 52 verses out of the Bible, one for every day of the week, uh, every week of the year, with the devotional thoughts and guides that if you learn those 52 verses, you will understand the overarching view of Scripture, and you'll begin to know the Bible. You know, it, it came when I heard my little grand, grandchild quote a whole psalm from memory, and it dawned on me how few people I know today memorize Scripture. So Joshua 1.8, as you know, says, This book of the law shall not depart out of our mouths, but we shall meditate on it day and night, in order to do all that's written therein, and then we'll make our way successful, then we'll have good success. So so 52 scripture verses every believer should know, the Bible code, they, they memorize one a week. And, and, the, and, the, and the essence of it, uh, J. John, is not, I'm not trying to get people into the, into the word. I'm trying to get the word into people. Yes. And when the word of God resonates in our hearts, when we memorize the scripture, we can take it with us. And it's amazing how the Spirit of God will bring that to our mind. Because as you know, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so it's not about getting people into the Word. We talk a lot about that. I want to get the Word into the people. Absolutely. And then we won't have to work. Yes, OS, definitely. I've got some of you, them here, the Jesus Code. Um, I've got your Bible Code. I've got the promise code and the prayer code. Right, just yeah. just unpack for us um, a little. So, for example, the promise code, what's, what's in there? Well, that's the latest one. Uh, let me come to that in a moment. Okay. The second one is the Jesus code. What happened was, I, I just wrote this Joshua code, 52 scripture verses every believer should know. And... Uh, I had, I promised God that all the royalties from all of these code books would go to Mission Dignity, serving these retired pastors and their widows. Now, they've sold over 3 million copies, J. John. I would like to think if I'd have known they were going to be that successful, I would have still been that benevolent. But I, a deal with God is a deal with God. Of course. So immediately, this book took off, sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And so I, uh, I, I, I was reading the Gospels as I've done hundreds of times over the decades of my Christian experience. And one day I saw something I'd never seen before. That's happened to all of us. Yes. God just, the Spirit of God quickens something to us. And even though we've seen it before, I, how did we not see it? And it was the numbers of times Jesus asked questions in the Bible. Think about that. He was not just omnipotent and could walk on water and raise the dead and had all power. He was omniscient. He never came to, we never read about him in the Gospels coming to a situation and say, whoa, that was a surprise. I didn't see that one coming. He, he had all knowledge and all foreknowledge. And yet he was always asking questions. I count, there are over 150 unique questions that escaped the lips of Jesus in the Gospels. And uh, it, it dawned on me that, that that was his way of, of of teaching us and getting us to see where we were. It wasn't because he needed answers. And I, I read one time someone said that, that real leadership is characterized by punctuation marks. Have yes. you ever heard that? Yeah, it's very and, and, good. Know, some, people, some people think that, that leadership is characterized by the period, the command, the mandate, go here, go there, do this, do that, bark orders. And some by the exclamation point, enthusiasm and optimism and expectancy. But more often than not, true leaders are characterized by that symbol that's bent in humility. We call the question mark. So Jesus is always asking questions. And so it, uh, the Jesus code came from that. I, I listed all of them, meditated on them. And, and just parenthetically, I believe every ep epoch of Christian history has had one of these questions from the lips of Jesus that was their question of their time. Had they not answered it 
we we wouldn't have seen the church marches that had the first epoch. They had a question, John 13, 38. He's, he asked this question, will you lay down your life for me? Will you lay down your life for my sake? And all of those apostles except John and multiplied thousands of those early believers, Polycarp and Ignatius and on and on and on did that. They answered the question of their time. The church marched on. The second epoch, another question, Matthew twenty-two forty-two. 42, uh, what think you the Christ? Whose son is he? Yes. And that took us to 325 when Athanasius, and we, 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 we established the fact that Jesus was co-equal, co-existent with the father of the same nature. On and on, the uh, the next period is we see the church in a dark period held in the Roman popes and John eleven forty. Did I not say unto you that if you would believe and be people of faith alone, you'd see the glory of God? And through answering the question of that time, the great faith movement we call the Reformation spread through Europe. And I could go on and on through every epoch of Christian history I want, but they all have a question for, for our time. And I think our generation has a question for our time. It's as unique to us as any. It's the question Jesus asked in Matthew 16, 15. Who do you say that I am? Yes. This issue of the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ is our issue in a world that's filled with pluralism and her twin children of inclusivism and uh, 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 universalism is the, is, the, is the issue of our day. So I wrote to Jesus. I wrote to Jesus code 52 scripture questions every believer should answer. J. John, I think there are 52 questions in the Bible that every believer ought to be able to answer before they get to heaven. That came to Jesus code. And then on and on, the, the last one just out this week is yeah. the connection code. I, I don't even think you have it. No. It, really a, a, it's really a Bible study and devotional on the, on the letter to Paul's letter to Philemon on relationships and how to build relationships in life. Because uh, so many people are so bored. We go to school, we, we learn everything except how to deal with people. And that book of Philemon, that little letter that's reserved for all posterity is a case study of Paul writing to Philemon about relationships. All the years that I've known you, I mean, you're a man of great passion. You love the Lord, but you love his word. And, you know, why is it that so many of us in the church don't love his word? Uh, I, I wish I had the answer. I'd, I'd write a code book on that if I had the answer, J. John, but there's a multitude of answers for it. I mean, you know, we, we have to decide whether we love something or like something. And if we love something and are passionate about it, and, it, you know, I think it all goes back to a personal, we're talking about relationships. It goes to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if I, if I have, uh, if I have his word, if I have something he has said to me and I'm passionately in love, you know, when Susie and I were dating, we've been married over 50 years now, but I remember when we were dating, we went to different universities in different cities, but uh, I would get a, a letter from her and I would read that letter over and over and over and over. And, and you know what, when we were dating, we used to like to be together. Uh, and we used to like to be together alone. And how can you be in love with someone and not want to be alone with them? Yes. How can you be in love with someone and not want to read every word that they that they've said to you, and you know, there's a. I wrote the prayer code, forty Bible prayers yes. every believer should pray, because the prayer is so important. You know, there's a there's a prayer, J. John, that goes beyond mere words. We call it the I call it the prayer of communion. Yes. You know, when when we've gone through our prayers of confession and our prayers of adoration, our our, our prayers of petition and and uh, all of these different prayers. At the end, we just come to a place where we just sit alone with God and let him speak to us. And so so often we, we, we miss that part of two-way communication in prayer. Absolutely. And I mentioned Susie. When we were dating, we would sit out in 
you know, the first date we ever had, I, I man, I thought I, this girl, I, I want I, this girl. I'm, I, I could fall in love with this girl. So I took her out and I didn't want her to think I was a bore. She didn't want me to think she was a bore. And we talked incessantly the whole day. Never stopped talking, talking, talking. But you know, six or seven months after that, when our develop, relationship developed, I'd take her home to her parents' home where she was living at the time. And we'd pull up in front of that house and we'd sit out there in her driveway, sometimes for an hour and never say a word. But we were communicating a lot better than we were on that first date. Yeah, <laughs> I know. So there is, a, there is a prayer that goes beyond mere words, and that's just living in constant fellowship with Jesus. Because, J. John, we have a God who speaks to us yeah. by spirit, and I believe through his word. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you know when I, OS, when I came to Christ, I, as a student in London in 1975, I was um, trying to introduce uh, my, uh, my Muslim friend to Jesus. And in conversation with him, um, I put my Bible on the floor. And he said, Why did you do that? And I said, Do what? He said, How could you put the Holy Scriptures on the floor. And from that day in 1975, I have never put the Bible on the floor. I, I, I can promise you, I would have asked you the same question. I know, I know, yeah, I know. And I've never put it on the floor. I, yeah. I've never been, you know, and, and the, the thing is, we have these Holy Scriptures. And as you said, we need to get them into us and and the bible you know is the only book we can read along with the author all the time now os just just let us in and tell us how is your devotional life how does that work on a daily basis for you what's your normal practice usually my wife susie and i are, are reading the same thing Maybe we're reading through the Gospels. Maybe we're 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 reading this apart from each other. And then at night, we'll we'll discuss it. It's not the volume for me, J. John. Yes. Some people think I've got to read five chapters a day. I've got no. I don't think it's the volume at all. I believe we've got a God who wants to speak to us, and and it's 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 taking it in smaller bites, and taking a verse, for example, and and. And it put reading a verse and putting an inflection on a different word every time, you know, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world. And just put a, a, a the inflection on it. I often wonder this about, about the God. You know, one of the things about the Bible, it's linear. And one day we're going to, I always wonder, how did Jesus inflect that sentence? Uh, what, how did, how did he say that when, 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 uh, when Elijah was uh, under the juniper tree and in the cave contemplating suicide, and the Lord came to him and said, he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? I, I, I wonder, what are, what's he saying? What are you doing here of all the people in the world? What are you doing here? Well, not much, Lord, just feeling myself. What are you doing here of all places? Where did he inflect that sentence? And I do that. I, I, I will take these questions of Jesus. I'll put an inflection on a different word and try to figure out what he was really getting at and what he was saying. Uh, it's, it's, uh, this, this, it's, a, it's, it's unfathomable. Absolutely. Never, well, what was the quote? That it's, it's deep enough. You can't touch the bottom. It's shallow enough. Well, I don't remember that quote. I know. Sure either. You're right. No, uh, OS. When I think of you and I think of our mutual friends, two of our mutual friends, uh, Dr. R.T. Kendall uh, right. and uh, Pastor Jack Graham, uh, the three of you love the Lord. You're passionate about his word. Uh, you're, you're proclaiming the gospel. You're teaching it. Um, and you, have, all three of you have been so faithful and uh, even in your latter years, <laughs> you're yes, still and we were in the latter years. Latter years, you're still being fruitful. 
I, I love the fact that your models of longevity, what is it that keeps you going? You know, you, you're not retiring. No, I'll never retire. No one retires from ministry, I don't think. <clears throat> we may be vocational somewhere, but I'm always God willing as long as he gives me health. Uh, I, I still feel like I'm 45, J. John. That's part of my problem. But, you know, in answer to your question, you take Jack Graham and I. Now, he was there the day I was saved. We were teenagers together. We were over 17. And over the course of these last 60 years, well, almost 60 years, over 50 years, we've been best friends. And yes. in, in the connection code with Philemon, uh, Paul closes that, you know, he asks Philemon, he's asking him to do a hard thing, take Onesimus back and forgive him. And at the end of that letter, he says, oh, by the way, Philemon, prepare the guest room for me. I'm coming by for a visit. Now, when, when Philemon read that, he said, uh-oh, he's going to come by and check on me. He's going to hold me accountable. He's going to see if I did this. We all need an accountability partner. And one of the ways that we've prospered, I think, in ministry is, is Jack and I, we, we've always held each other accountable uh, daily. And uh, RT and I have been 40 year dear, dear friends. And, uh, uh, you know, in life, J. John, if you're fortunate, you, uh, you, you may have one or two people outside your immediate family that really know you like you really are. And we all need somebody that will say, hey, get the guest room ready. I'm coming by and check up on you, see how you're doing. Absolutely. But, it's, but I'll tell you what it is, J. John. I think it's Jesus said, give us this day what? Our daily right. bread. It's daily bread. And when we get away from that, uh, we open the door to issues that yes. can be challenging. Oh, OS, you're an, an absolute joy. Thank you so much for encouraging us and inspiring us. And thank you so much for joining uh, me on Facing the Canon. Well, I, I love being there uh, with you today, J. John. And uh, on my website, oshawkins.com, there are many free book downloads on there. From I've written a lot of books, and a lot of them are free book downloads on there. Many pastor shelves, videos, so much is on there free, but also information on all of the code books and how you can get them at oshawkins.com. Brilliant, OS. Thank you so much. I really hope you've enjoyed that conversation with Dr. O.S. Hawkins. Well, it certainly inspired me to go deeper into the word and allow the word to get deeper into me. Please do look at these code books. And as uh, Dr. O.S. said, lots of free downloads. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again. Thank you.